should be able to see that indeed we do have a nice oval pattern there. Same way with the back. If we compare it to our the one we were shooting for, it's reasonably close. Little, uh, little would have been nicer to have a little bit more material right there. I don't know what happened right there. Maybe I should have put more measurements, but it feels good. I think I can live with that. All right, so what we got going on here? The only thing remaining now is to carve this out. Now I laid this on right on the top of the vise, and then I drew inside, and we, I kind of get an idea what we need to cut, and then. Of course, how deep do I want to be? I want this to be, I like my head, the heads to stick out a little bit. And so I'll, um, I want that to fit right down there on the, on the mark. So the I think the best way to go about this is just to, uh, we'll just whittle it out real quick with, a uh, uh, by hand. For this sort of carving, my favorite knife are these, uh, that traditional, uh, Swedish, these are, uh, the, was this is made by Mura? Eric Frost Mura, Sweden. This is the same knife that they use. Um, last time we were in Sweden, we visited the, uh, oh, is it the province or state of Mura where they make the uh, the beautiful little uh, Dalahest horses, the little iconic Swedish horses. And this is the the knife, the exact knife that the, the guys were using. I actually went and, and I had them show me how to use them and they showed me how to sharpen them. And they said it was all about that little bump right there. And they're right. I have one without the bump and it's not as good. These are wonderful knives. Of course, Scandi scan grinds, so uh, to sharpen them, I mean, they're just so easy to sharpen. Any little stone, you just hold that angle there and just a couple passes. It's not a big production. It's just such a, such a good workhorse. If I can find these on Amazon, they were, they're not, they're not expensive. I'll put them up. I'll put one up there for you because they are they're just absolutely wonderful. So what we could do here now is we could just go along. We've got our mark right there and just kind of consistently we're just going to just shave that off there. It's a slow process, so put on a CS Forester book and uh, get a comfortable chair and just start working on it and uh, until we get a perfect fit. This is actually a, a quite enjoyable process. Now make sure you keep a reference, okay, that you put it when you're fitting uh, this, we've, you put it on the same, you orient it the same way each time. So I know that I've got this knot here um, and I know I'm putting forward, so I want to make sure it goes in. So once you get close, um, you, you're going to want to fit this and give it a light tap. Use something that's soft. Uh, I use a rawhide mallet or a rubber mallet. You want to work that back and forth a little bit. You may have to do this many, many times. And this is where, this is where if you do it right here, where your handle is going to uh, not come loose on you. So we can see on there, see the rub marks? Got the rub marks there from the, from the head. And that looks good So because we're coming in contact in almost all areas across here. See, it's where it's actually burnishing the wood. So we just go along here. And this is where this little knife is so wonderful, very controllable. And just go along there and just we're just matching. We're just matching what we have there. Take your time. If you get if you start coming against you know the grain changes on you there, just come back at you. Safety Sally started typing right there. Never cut towards yourself. Yeah, you know, the thing with never cut towards yourself. That's something you tell children uh, who are learning how to use and work with tools, right? And it's the same thing that comes up in the shop. You know, you whenever someone sees me put a hand plane down, face down on the bench, the reason why you think you should never do that is because shop teacher back in the day had to sharpen all those and he got tired of uh, kids putting them, sitting them down on the metal benches and on table saws and having to constantly sharpen them. So, you know, that was a, that was a, something they taught children because they didn't know any better. It doesn't apply to, to, 
us today. You know, you, if you're going to put a, you can put a plane down on a wooden bench um, with the blade down, it's not going to hurt a thing. You can cut towards yourself if you have been doing this and have experience and know what you're doing, you can do it safely. It's just a, I guess that's my pet peeve there. Okay, so we've kind of trimmed that up there. Let's make sure we're oriented the same way. See if we get any further. When you know you're getting close, make sure you pull it out and then get the uh, cut, get ready to cut your, your kerf. Uh, use a very a saw with a very fine set of teeth. Actually, I'm going to use my Japanese back saw here. It's a little even finer than that. Now the question is, how far, how far down do you go? Well. It kind of depends. You want to, as a rule of thumb, don't go any less than half of the thickness of the of the of the head, right? So you know, so somewhere down in there, I like to go a little bit further, even three quarters, because what happens is, you're, if you don't go deep enough, your wedge will bottom out. This is actually the a great saw for this because it doesn't have hardly any set in it so it's making a very small a very small uh, blade so what I'm talking about is your wedge so make sure that you understand exactly how far you went down and if you have your wedge ready that you're going to use take a pencil and line that up right to the bottom exactly where the top of that is. You don't want to drive it beyond. There's not going to be any point. You end up splitting the wood. So you want to be sure that you give yourself enough that you can get a, a nice proper wedge in there. So I'm going to go, I'm going to go right there. Call that good. Okay, we're about flush with the top. Now we want to sit down hard on that shoulder. So we're, we're going to be pretty good. So to do the final seat, we don't want to hit it this way up. You want to hit the bottom of the handle. I'll show you why here. I just realized that I had uh, the wrong shutter speed set for my frame rate. So not sure how this video is going to look. Okay, anyway, we'll go with what we have. So once you get that uh, stuck on there pretty good, we're going to want to take a hammer that's got some weight to it um, and something usually a dead blow hammer or something this has a plastic plastic on it and we're gonna strike it in the bottom which sounds kind of counterintuitive but man nothing drives more force onto a handle than doing it that way you can see I gotta put a little chamfer on there this is true with any axe head or hatchet you do. And the, the trick is is to kind of hold it loosely in the hand. What you what you want is when you when you impact the handle, you want it to kind of slip through your hands a little bit and the mass of the head is, will hold it there and it will drive it. And listen, use your senses, listen, you can hear it. It will drive it down so hard onto that handle, you won't believe it. So this turned out really good. That, look how far we got that handle um, driven down on there and look how tight everything is around there that's what we're looking for we don't want to voice you know, when you're working with these cast or forge tools there are going to be inconsistencies and and you'll they'll never be perfect but that is really sitting hard on that shoulder right there and you can see the how tight it is the same way around the top you see that we're we've got everything filled up and even that kerf that we put in there we're going to be hard pressed to get much of a wedge in there just because it's so so tight um, and this is a handle that's going to be it's just not going to come loose it's going to it's seasoned wood that's been in a warm shop for many years has a super low moisture content and um, if we wedge this properly we're going to be we're going to be in good shape look at that 
Now you can buy wedges or you can make your own. You can use, a, a lot of guys use pine. I typically use whatever I have. It doesn't seem to make that much difference as long as it's dry. Um, when you buy, you, you know, when you buy your little wedge deal, sometimes they'll come with one. So if you, you get one that's the wrong shape, it's not a big deal. I like to, to really, you know, press it. I want it to, to squeeze. I want it to be a little bit wider than the hole there. So what you can do is, is you can trim them. So just, you know, make kind of a note there and wedges should be made out of really straight grained wood. So they should split cleanly. And there now we're got that in there. This is so very tight that it, we might have trouble getting it started. So that's the case. We can even open this up a bit with our saw. I mean, it, it's, it's the fit I've got so tight. It's almost as if it didn't, I, I can't even feel the curve. So hopefully we can get this in there. So here's something I've been using. It's called swell lock and what it's supposed to do is it's, is it's supposed to go into the wood and swell the wood, uh, but not leave. It, it won't evaporate. Uh, it, look how it drinks that in there. That is really something. And so what it does is it goes in there and then it hardens and dries um, and it swells. Is it intravascular or extracellular? What is it? I can't remember it from my medic days. Uh, swells the cells. Uh, and then it doesn't leave there. That's the problem with water. Water will go in and swell the cells in the wood and it will tighten up ahead temporarily. But once the water leaves and it evaporates, then it will, um, you're essentially worse off than when you started. Here's a good perspective. You can see now, see, I've got that, that's sticking out of there about half an inch or so. Look at the, at the flare. Look at how much that's mushroomed out of there. Out of there. That's going to be nice and tight. That's going to hold a long time. That swell lock also seems to uh, keep the, uh, keep the wedge and everything intact. Then I'll, uh, I'll come back here. Some people like to cut them flush. I don't cut them flush. I, I like to leave an eighth of an inch or so. I think, Aesthetically, it looks nice, and I think it makes for a stronger, a stronger bond, and, and it just gives a little bit more. Let's you know, leaving that flare out of there is going to be uh, is going to help it out. Then after your trim, put your your swell lock in there, and let that uh, drink down in there. Keep adding until it just won't take anymore. And you know, there's only one thing left to do. Of course, we got to treat the wood, treat the handle, of course. And we're going to use our, boy, I got all my toys out here. We're going to use our boiled linseed oil. Just can't go wrong with that. Wear some gloves. Keep Sally happy. Oh man, I just boiled, boiled linseeded my floor. Boiled linseed oil, of course, is, uh, is what you want to apply to all your tool handles. And the old, the old timers used to say, uh, you do it once a day for a week, once a week for a month, once a month for a year, and after that, once a year annually. So in the fall, or in the fall is kind of our routine is to, is to take all of the tool handles and scrape off the mud and the sap and the pitch and then give them a good coat. Um, wipe it off, don't let it dry on there, uh, but just keep applying it. So on the fresh wood, uh, just put one coat on there, warm it. The warmth of your hands will help kind of rub it in. Don't neglect the ends. Um, and I just go ahead and just rub a, rub it on the metal too. It, it, is, it does de definitely help preserve or pr protect it from, from rust. And once you have applied it, then just wipe it down, wipe it off. We'll finish up by taking a quick look at our work here. I'd have to say that it turned out very nice. It, it, indeed, it, it truly is. It's an oval handle. Is it perfect? No, this was, look right there, you can see I got too deep right there. This was the first time I ever made, tried to do offset turning, I guess you call it, with a, with a lathe. So I, I just took my knife there and of course, of course you want to cut a little chamfer on the corners there. So if you come down you hit something, it won't split your, your handle. But it is, um, it does, it is a nice handle. It fits the, ha it fits the hammer well. Um, the fit is excellent. I have no, uh, 
no issues there. Nothing like hickory. I mean, as soon as you grab it, it's these are really delightful, these little hammers to use because having that really small, that three quarter to half inch bit of um, a taper in them, uh, it gives a lot of um, snap to the hammer. Uh, it, it, it whips, it actually, you can, it, it bends and springs back. And that's what makes hickory such a wonderful tool handle wood is that it has that spring, that liveliness uh, as it's described by the old timers back in the day, they, you know, a lot of wood there is tough enough, oak, for example, or different maples, they're tough enough for handles, but they're dead. They don't have that spring, that liveliness uh, that you get from uh, a hickory handle. And the thinner it is, uh, the more pronounced that is, the nicer, more pleasant it feels. It almost feels like it's assisting you. Um, and, but this is a small hammer for detail work, so we don't need a ton of strength. You can see Granddad had his hammers, and they had that very slight, really small, look right here, really small form. Mine's even smaller. Mine maybe a little bit too small, uh, but uh, still good. Next one will be better. So that was uh, fun to do, and we learned a lot. So I'm looking forward to the comments for you guys that are pro turners can tell me how we can figure out how to be a little bit more consistent and know when to stop on that taper. Um, but... Indeed, it is. It is nice. That's one problem I don't like with the lay is, is having the you got the holes in the bottom. I guess you could cut that off. Guy probably ought to make his hand a little bit longer, extra half inch or so, that so you can cut that off with the saw and, and get rid of those because they they don't look very nice. Yeah, there you go. All right, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to click the thumbs up, thumbs up. See you in the next one.